questions and can maybe translate some of their behavior and tell us how you feel now as you see various calls for them to be uh, chopped up into bits. Um, I thought we would start by talking about YouTube, which I think it's fair to say has had a tough week. Uh, they made a series of decisions and then apologized for those decisions and then said they were maybe going to think about changing their policies in, in the future. Um, Jessica, you used to run communications at Google. Give us a sense of how a decision like that gets made around how to enforce a, a policy decision and then how it negotiates deciding what it's going to apologize for and then kind of deal with that fallout in the, the community. Um, you just apologize for everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, at least right now. At least right now. Um, so a piece of content is flagged or it, it's escalated, right? It's, it's, you become aware of the content. Uh, there's content policy teams that are thinking very, very deeply about how, where this fits in. So if it's a piece of violent content, is it within a context of news? Is it docu like, is there documentary value? Um, the, and they're trying to think of what are, you know, there's content that appears all the time that's horrifically offensive that I think anyone on a common sense level would say we should get rid of this. But then you look at all the unintended consequences at the moment that you get rid of that piece of content, what happens with these other kinds of things that actually probably should be on the platform. And so there's usually a recommendation about what to do. If, you know, um, I think you were, the, the Peter yesterday was pushing Susan on whether she had viewed a particular video and that kind of thing. Right. Um, it, it's certainly not part of the process that a CEO or an exec is reviewing that content. That would probably not be a good use of their time. Um, but if something is blowing up externally, of course, any exec that is touching that on some level, communications, the CEO, whatever it might be, might be reviewing a particular video or might be looking at a compilation because you want to know what's going on in your platform and the decisions being made, but they're not ultimately making that call. And I think that's a good thing because the people, content moderation is so hard. Like yeah. anyone in this room would, if we tried to do what they're doing every day, I think we have a hard time. And so, you know, I think uh, it's actually right that the groups are doing it. If there's a problem, I think it's that these are not new problems. They've been there from the very start. And I think historically the platforms have been way too lax in terms of what is allowed. And so it's great that they're now moving towards having much stricter policies, but it, we should, that should have happened before. Yeah, I mean, externally to me, it feels very much like everyone's flying by the seat of their pants. Everything is being made up as we go along, and there's not really any accountability uh, for these companies. Like inside, and maybe you, know, you, you can speak to this too, when there's a, a tough legal decision that, that needs to get made or when you know, advertising policies are being written, is there a sense of internal calm or is it always just kind of like, I don't know, it's always chaos. Yeah, right. Um, that's comforting. That's part, of, that's part of the deal. I, so, so like, just to step back for a minute, I think that like if you look at the 20 years that we've had really strong commercial web uh, services, um, I think in the first era, and I am of that era, like we were building tech and thinking we were going to change the world for the good, that connecting everyone was going to be awesome, that everyone would have access to information, and, and all of a sudden, you know, children in small African villages were going to be able to see the same things that you could at Knoxford University. That's amazing, and that still exists by the way, but I think that, um, and I, I think that still people who are in tech are largely there to try to do good. But I also think that we have gotten either intellectually lazy or simply complacent about the fact that technology does not equal good. And, and there's a technological historian named Melvin Krasberg who says like, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Mm. So the thing that I think technology companies need to realize now is, we, nobody owes us a free and open internet designed for our good, right? We have to build that with every product, with every business model, with every feature we launch. And, and that's the place we're at now, which is that we failed to build it at the beginning in our internal optimism. And, and we now know what it looks like for it to be weaponized, and we have to build to that. Right. And it seems to me that the frustration over the fact that we have not yet built, built the good internet is why uh, a lot of folks are now calling for some of these companies to be broken up. Right? I think there's a sense that maybe if they were smaller, they would be more manageable, that competition might encourage you know, new companies to try to build that, that better internet. Um, Antonio, you worked at Facebook. Do you yeah. think there's a good antitrust case to break up Facebook? I do, but I, I want to respond to one thing you said before on the accountability front. You know, I, it's, it's hard to ask for accountability from a corporate structure in which ultimately their loyalties lie with the shareholders and with the employees, right? Um, Chris Hughes got into this in his, in his famous Vanity Fair piece, and I, I've, I've written about it as well. I think if, if 
these decisions, part of the reason why everything seems so hair on fire is because suddenly Facebook has become like the, the Supreme Court of the United States and it's deciding what is free speech in the United States, right? Um, my personal opinion is I'd rather not there be government regulation of these companies, but if, there, if someone's going to regulate speech on Facebook, it should be the government, actually. That's who's accountable to us as democratic citizens inside this yeah. democracy. And so if you want to make it such that publishing anti-vax content is not a good thing or, or is taken down, well, then make it illegal. And Facebook follows a law in every market that it operates in. That I think a democracy is the structure where you get accountability, not a public company, frankly. But in I mean, I hear that, but also it's like, like what, Facebook has no incentive to, rec uh, to you know, recommend that a bunch of new moms join an anti-vax group, right? Like, to me, it seems like they have a rational self-interest in doing some of this stuff, and it shouldn't take regulation for them to get there. Well, but if it drives engagement, they could actually monetize that attention and that time on site. Right, right. So, that, so they have financial incentives to do it. Yeah. They're... All right, but you think it should be broken up anyway, so Yes, why? And, it, and not because it's going to solve this problem, to be clear, but um, yeah, for a long time, antitrust in this country since the 80s has been about consumer harm, right? Usually through the pricing mechanism. But what does that mean with a free app? It's impossible to actually figure out if there's consumer harm, right? So um, in the case of Facebook, it's pretty clear that the acquisition of WhatsApp and Instagram were obviously kind of anti-competitive blocking moves, right? Um, there's been polls out. A lot of Instagram and WhatsApp users don't even realize that it's owned by Facebook, right? So they're getting zero utility out of the fact that it's owned by Facebook. So I think if you, if you structure antitrust in terms of why you should do antitrust around rather than consumer harm, lack of consumer benefit, but huge benefit to the sort of conglomerate, um, I, mean, I think on this stage basically yesterday, Boz effectively caught to the fact that, um, you know, he was trying to make a case against antitrust, which is, oh, we can, we can moderate content better if we're one single entity. Right. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. Let me try to phrase it a different way. Um, if you've raised the bar on content moderation such that something like the Christchurch shooting video, for example, has to be brought down in, in two hours, if that's like table stakes now for a social network, your ability to do that is now a competitive advantage. Right? That's one way of, of looking at it. And yeah, of course, Facebook is way better at doing that. Um, if they have an operation staff of 10,000 people, which you've reported on. And, yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I think that the, the justification for breaking a face would be that they have massive economies of scale when it comes to the technical and sort of operation side of, of their amalgam. And I, I think it's not going to solve this problem, but over the long term, the innovation you would drive through competition would potentially solve some of these problems. Right. Uh, Nicole and Jessica, uh, you all both worked at Google. Do you see a good case for antitrust uh, for that company? So uh, let me try and take it in a slightly different yeah. way, which is I think we have to figure out what we're trying to solve for. And it's not just bigness. I mean, like, bigness is a part of the problem because of scale, but, but, but it's not just bigness. So, like, if we break up the companies, but they're still all operating and competing in an ad ecosystem, which is driven by collecting all of our personal information and, and manipulating our, our um, ad attention and our preferences, we haven't solved the problem that we're trying to solve, right? So, like, I don't think breaking up the companies may be a step, but it's not sufficient to address the harms that I think we're worried about. Uh -huh. I think. Yeah, I, I heard um, Facebook yesterday, and the argument they've, they made, and that they've made before, like you were saying, is this idea that if they were just, you keep everything together, you get all the benefits of all these resources, which, and that they can then solve the problems, which is kind of like an oil company telling you that right. you shouldn't look at alternative energy sources because <laughs> the oil company is the best to fix the oil spills, right? Like, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Now, if you were, like, you used the example of content moderation, so if you look at that and you make the argument, which I think is very credible, that the more data you have, the more you're going to be able to train the AI models, which is going to, like, which ultimately is what you want. You don't want to be doing human moderation. Um, fine. Yes, it's better to have all the assets for all that data. But then figure out a way for the industry to pool that stuff. Like, that already happens today. If you look at child sexual abuse imagery, the companies all work together on that. Why could, like, who, why should you ever have a competitive advantage on anti-harassment? Like, it, bullying should not be a proprietary technology. That should be something that the industry could figure out together and benefit from. So you could, like, if there was, if they had to figure it out, they would figure it out. They all figured out how to pivot to mobile, right, which we all thought was gonna be so hard. They all figured out how to pivot to mobile. They can figure out how to do this. And I think your point, more broadly about all the companies is right. Like there's a conflation of privacy anxiety and content moderation and a just general sense of bigness and not knowing where the companies end. And so I think any regulation for it to be effective needs to be very clear on what it's trying to solve, but also really getting at issues of control and transparency. And then finally, I would say also looking at, um, I think it's wrong that a startup today has to be thinking about what their path is to get acquired by one of the big companies. And so I think, I think that actually is fundamental. How do you make startups, how do you create I wonder if there are specific regulations 
perspective, right? Like, would a would a GDPR coming to America? Um, are there regulations around content moderation, around election integrity? Like, what what feels the most urgent to you? I would get rid of third-party data companies for one. Um, Say a little bit about what a third-party data company does. So I, I'm not a big fan of GDPR in general, but I think it's got a couple aspects to it I think that are a good thing. One is data portability, the fact that you can take your data away from Facebook, even though there's still a network effect there, so who knows, but still, you should have that right. Uh, the other is first party versus third party interaction, right? First party is a very natural thing. You have a relationship with Netflix, say. You use Netflix and it gives you recommendations. Your, your experience of the service improves because they use your viewing data to build models, right? Um, third party data is me Googling your name and getting an SEO from various companies that I can mention that I won't, uh, that offer me to look up all your financial voting and criminal records for the past 30 years, right? Or it's your carrier selling your geo data, trying to squeeze a little bit more, you know, juice from the lemon uh, to, you know, uh, to the ad tech stack. That, to, that sort of third party usage in which you see no benefit from it whatsoever, and it's very murky and have very little control, I'm very skeptical of. While I'm less skeptical of first party companies, and Facebook is a first party in terms of their experience, they only run ads on themselves, um, so is Netflix and so is a bunch of companies, I think that should be regulated more lightly, because in some sense, you, the consumer, look, the reality with privacy is that it's always a trade-off between privacy and convenience and security, right? We make that, that trade-off all the time, right? If the government said, hey, I want, we need to get your fingerprints, no one would ever do it, right? But hey, you can skip the TSA line if you do, and we call it pre, like, where do I put my fingers, right? That's the trade-off. And so I think as long as you're making the right trade-off that you yourselves all have to make for yourselves between privacy and convenience with a company you recognize, I think it's okay. Right. But as soon as you start losing that connectivity between utility that I'm seeing and control I have and where my data goes, I think that's a problem. And so that's one thing GDPR, I think, does very well. Yeah. I don't know if I'd go for as far as like get rid of all third party data companies because I think that they, they do drive values that like not every company can be a consumer facing company, right? Some of them are just going to do back end stuff and that's a, that's a value. Um, but I do think that like, I feel like I'm going to quote House Stark, right? It's like regulation is coming. <laughs> regulation is here and it's time and, and it's good. I, I, like, I, I have the same sort of qualms about GDPR and, and sort of the export of European values all around the world because it doesn't actually fit in every other country. Right. Um, but I, I think the things that were really important was like it required you to put somebody in charge of privacy and data. It required you to have a program that was documented. In other words, somebody had to allocate resources and budget to a thing and make sure that the executives get a regular report about it. That actually matters hugely. With the companies that I, I consult with now, like that has been monumental in changing culture and executive perspective. And I think those types of regulations can do a lot. Yeah, uh, you, you mentioned company culture. This is one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about the most, which is the difference in the uh, sort of internal activism culture at Google versus Facebook, right? So Google last year, we see this uh, amazing walkout and protest of injustices at the company, and it seems like it sparked like you know, almost an existential crisis at the company about what its values are. Um, we've never seen anything similar within Facebook, right? There's never been like a group of employees like coming together to publicly protest uh, an internal action. Uh, why was the Google walkout possible and, and why does the Facebook walkout seem impossible? Well, I think Google, first of all, I would hope that the reasons for the Google walkout in terms of paying off a bunch of men who were accused of sexual harassment, I would hope that that would not be dependent on company culture, and I actually think that probably could have happened at Facebook. But I agree that um, that there are cultural differences. I think Google, I mean, Google's the internet, right? Like when it was when it was started, the idea was open access to information, making information more accessible to everyone. And that was as much the vision externally and what they were building as it was internally. I mean, you, there was a point, it's not the case anymore, anyone could see the code base. Right? You could ask questions every week to the founders. Um, and there's always been an activist culture there. It's just that it wasn't necessarily playing out externally. Um, it's become much more heightened, I think, particularly post-2016. But um, Google's always had that. Um, and I could think of innumerable examples of where the employees have pushed back and actually reversed company policy on things. Yeah. As you watch it, do you think, like, this uh – this, this kind of current unease could spill over and make life more difficult for the company to, you know, uh, I don't know, just innovate, keep, like keep making product. Like, is there, like, is, is there a risk that the um, employee base loses confidence in the executives and it, it triggers like some kind of broader issue? I mean, I think there's always, I think, yes, I think it, it creates problems for sure. 
I think the bigger issue, which is not only applicable to Google, but all the larger big tech companies, is that if you start to lose tech talent in particular, because they no longer want to work at the company, that some of the things that used, obviously the salaries are insane, and that will still continue to pull a ton of people into these companies. But some of the additional perks, right, that you'd be at a party and people are like, oh, you work at this company, or your parents would get super excited. If some of that stuff starts to fall by the wayside, and meanwhile you have a ton of startups, say, in San Francisco, so now you get to live in a city, you're not on a, a bus two hours a day, um, you know, I think that's actually the danger. And, and I, but I also think it's also the promise, right? That I think that, that one of the greatest things, like regulation will happen, it'll probably be ham-fisted, it'll probably be awkward, and we'll probably all be criticizing it the whole way through. But I think some of the biggest drivers of change at the company will be on the cultural side and the actual employees pushing for that change. So I, on the whole, I think it's actually a positive. I think, so I think Antonio can speak to Facebook. I don't, I don't know if it's directly, but watching what's happening, I think there's what the founder says is, is, is the way things are. I think there are some that are mission driven. And, and to me, those are the companies like what they're putting into the world. Like when I see the, these employees um, walking out or, or activating on what they think their products should be or shouldn't be used for, I think that's amazing. Ownership about what the executive or someone who's coding at the, at the lower levels. I agree with you completely, and it raises the question, why don't people do that at Facebook? Yeah, you know, it was, it's funny what you said. I think at least when I was there, and I think the culture just changed slightly. Religion seems to me, uh, Facebook seems something between a religion and an empire that you were a part of, right? So I think it was partially mission driven and partially founder driven. And people were very loyal to Zuckerberg. And, and but I think what you're seeing now is really protest. That's going a little bit too far. I don't think. Uh, that's quite the Facebook vibe. But a lot of the leaks that you're seeing coming out of Facebook would have been absolutely unthinkable five years ago. And to me, that really is a sign, a symptom of some sort of internal turmoil going out of Facebook and people questioning what the impact of that society is. But as Jessica said, I think it's funny because when you're inside these companies, from the outside, they and very impenetrable. But when you're inside, a lot of the leaks have been precisely about, you know, Boz, for example, executives having very frank and open discussions with every employee saying, this is what we're doing and these are the trade-offs. So inside, it actually is a, a, a culture of, like, open questioning and debate. The thing is, when you go to the outside, right, I think that's where it gets, um, that's, where, that's where the cracks in the facade are appearing, I think. Making stuff to you, Casey. Right. <laughs> Open. <laughs> so um, we only have a couple of minutes left. Nicole, I know high note and maybe talk about some tech out there that you saw living up to the ideal that you mentioned earlier, where it is tech that is that is good and intentional, where, where people are taking ownership of it. So you've worked in the public and the private sector. Like, what is something out there that makes you feel like tech uh, is still going to be a positive force? Uh, so Aren't you tired of being beaten up? Like, let's talk about tech for good. As yeah. opposed to, like, just tech, how bad tech is for all, all of our democracies. Um, so, so here's the thing I want to say is, like, you have the power to change things. And there is actually an institution where its entire business is about making people's lives better, and it is your government. So I know that, like, we have a really important election coming up, and I thought Stacey Abrams last night was phenomenal. We need to all pay attention to that, but the problems that we have in this country and around the world are going to be with us way beyond the 2020 election. So here's my plea is you understand scale and infrastructure and UX and how to deliver services to people and make it easy. Your government really needs you. 
we need to all go out and serve because the government is just us and we're only as good as we get it to be. I am tired of listening to politicians who have the barest understanding of how the internet works and that's on us. So we have to get out there and I don't care whether it's you go vote or you get your neighbors to vote or you serve a tour with US Digital Services or Code for America. They are doing amazing things like in California, which is where I'm from, um, they just got a million more people in California on food stamps because the paperwork was keeping a lot of people who are eligible from it from getting the food they need and food insecurity is a huge problem, particularly for the senior population. They just went through and worked with counties to clear people's criminal records. One in three Americans has something on their background um, check that indicates that they have a criminal history and that keeps them from employment, from student loans, from housing. Some Code for America teams went in and are cleaning up these things so that people in the hundreds of thousands can suddenly start turning around their lives. If you want to make an impact, go serve. And if you are a woman or a person of color, I am doubling down on you. It is time for you to get in there. Awesome. <laughs>